All right. Awesome. Everything looking okay on my screen? Cool. Perfect. Um, so good morning, everyone. We are almost halfway through our 2023 webinar series, and we are very excited to bring you another amazing speaker today, um, this time to talk about trees as keystone species. First, just a little bit about us. We are People and Pollinators Action Network, um, a 501c3 nonprofit in Colorado, focused on grassroots advocacy through a number of more specific avenues, particularly education, outreach, policy, community mobilization, and pollinator habitat creation. Um, today, we'll be hearing from Ryan Bartlett, a certified arborist, naturalist, and educator. Ryan founded Colorado Native Bee, an organization that teaches people about our state's native pollinators and the importance of native flora as habitat. And Ryan also just completed a field guide to native bees, which I'm sure he'd be more than happy to talk about if any of you have questions. Um, I'm going to keep this slide super brief because Ryan is obviously much more of an expert than I am on this subject, but in case any of you are wondering why we chose this topic for a pollinator webinar, trees are actually very important for pollinator well-being, providing significant food resources, um, nesting locations for certain species, and general ecosystem services that pollinators rely on. And with that, I just want to thank you all again for being here and wanting to support PPN. If you're interested in donating so we can continue to put on free events like this for you, I'll be putting the link to our donation page in the chat. Um, also, if you're interested in future events, please consider following us on Instagram and Facebook at People and Pollinators. And you can, of course, visit our website, www.peopleandpollinators.org for more information, our volunteer sign up and events to come. Um, a few super quick reminders, please stay unmuted for the duration of the webinar today and instead leave any questions that you might have for Ryan. So sorry if you heard that, it's very loud outside. <laughs> um, if you have any questions, leave them in the chat. I'll be keeping track of those throughout the discussion and then facilitating a short Q&A at the end, time permitting. Um, so thank you all so much for being here and I hope you enjoy. And Ryan, over to you. Great, let me just share my screen. Oh, you see that all right? Yes, you're looking yes. great. Okay, great. Thank you everybody for joining. I see some familiar faces. Uh, thank you all for being here and, and uh, the new ones as well. So today I wanna to talk about trees as keystone species. Is my volume okay? Can you hear me all right? Yes, okay, great. So viewing trees as keystone species. So I could have also, you're right, I cannot, Nicole, I cannot advance my screen. Yes, um, just like there, there. Great. click anywhere on screen go. and then use the arrow keys and you're good. There we go, okay. So I could have also named it a thousand reasons why I love trees. And so today we're gonna to explore basically everything that has some sort of um, interaction with trees, whether it be insects, mammals, birds, um, microorganisms, spiders, all sorts of stuff. So, and including us. So let's go ahead and dive into that. So first I want to talk about what is a keystone species. So keystone species uh, can first be described in architecture. So keystone, capstone, it's that center stone in the middle that's keeping the whole arch together. Uh, it's the final piece that locks it all into place. And so we see that uh, extremely well, even in this, uh, this old ruin. Uh, the only thing still standing is the, the arches. Everything else is, is done because that capstone, that keystone is so vital to the construction of that and so strong, so strong to keep that together. And so in nature, we've got uh, certain animals that are considered keystone species, uh, like the wolf, the wolf uh, keeping down populations. Um, but if you were to remove those wolves, uh, the whole ecosystem would crash. You'd have major changes because one keystone animal was removed. And so there's a book that I love 
Uh, the author, Aldo Leopold, wrote a Sand County Almanac, and he says it very well. I now su suspect that just as a deer herd lives in mortal fear of its wolves, so does a mountain live in mortal fear of its deer. Without that, that wolf to keep down that population of deer, uh, the mountain's just being completely stripped. So there's an example of a keystone species keeping things in check. Today, we're gonna to talk about a couple of topics. One is mammals, birds, insects, reptiles, and fungus, and a couple other fun things. So let's first, let's talk about mammals. So today, I'm, all, I'm gonna focus on the word arboreal mammals. A lot of people think of arboreal as, you know, they're only living in trees. I want to sort of expand that a little bit into anything that has an association with trees. As you'll see, they, they may not necessarily live in a tree all the time, but today for the purposes of this presentation, it's an association with this, those trees. So the first one that I want to focus on is a keystone species in itself. So the beaver, beaver, the American and the European beaver, we see them as a keystone species because they create wetlands, they create ecosystems where you find higher populations of waterfowl, fish. You see more trees actually in areas where you've got beaver that have been active for a long time. Uh, people can't seem to see that when they're, you've got beavers happening in that spot that haven't been there and trees are being down for their dams. But once the dam is in place, you see lots of different types of trees populating in areas. And with that, with that dam, you've got an increase of the water retention, the base water, ground recharges, more, more vegetation, more trees, more wildlife, and you see lower instances of fire. So beavers in themselves, if they were to be removed, the whole ecosystem tends to crash. So good example of a keystone species. And beavers, actually as their food sources utilize trees uh, for that they they have alder aspen apple birch cherry cottonwood willow everything that you would find here in the front range uh, even in all across colorado or the rocky mountain region all these trees are present and the cool thing about beavers is they actually have this underwater refrigerator they will drag live branches down underwater kind of tuck it in this area that's Cold, cold water and those branches will remain viable for a fairly long time. And so even through the winter, they can have a source of food. So we see trees being utilized both in their dams and in their diet. Uh, it's very much vital part of their, their lifestyle. Unfortunately, as everybody may know, the, the climate of beaver happened pretty pretty much by the 1800s. So we had fewer than 1,200 individuals of the Eurasian and less than 100,000 of the North American beavers by the late 1800s. And luckily, we've, we've been able to increase their populations from about 10% of that prior estimation, but that's still absolutely just a fraction of the number numbers. So hopefully the beaver gets a little more respect down the road. Here's a cool one. This is not North America, but this is in Europe. This is the Bechstein's bat. Bechstein's bat only roosts in trees with a hollow or a deep crevice. If, if you've got crevices in the bark, uh, they, will they will nest in that, but they're not cave dwellers. They do not nest in caves at all. They require an old growth tree to survive. So pretty neat. Um, without trees, we would not have the Bechstein's bat. Anybody from the East Coast may be familiar with this one. Uh, the, the opossums definitely uh, live in trees. I would definitely consider them free dwellers, and even though not all the time, but they, they love their trees. And then here in Colorado, this is actually a picture from the Golden area. Uh, these two um, elk are just doing a pruning job on this uh, residential crab apple tree. So, Yes, they may be doing some damage. It's pretty minimal. It wasn't very much. In fact, they probably are doing a better job than most of my certified arborist friends. But uh, we see that that 
mammals utilize trees, not just grasses and other plants, but trees for food sources as well as evident in this picture. All right, so that's kind of just a real brief, we could go on and on for days just about mammals, but I wanna jump into birds. Um, birds of all types. So we see birds nesting in trees. All of you are familiar with, with nests and trees, the big magpie nests and the little tiny hummingbird nest and the big eagle nests like the bald eagle, uh, bald eagle up in this, looks like a sycamore in the, the upper corner and a spruce down in the lower corner. And I know that bald eagles also utilize cliff, cliff walls for their nests, but they, they do tend to uh, often nest in trees. Uh, and then the great blue heron, the great blue heron really does not want to nest on the ground. They'll, they'll nest as high as they can, generally no less than 20 feet, but uh, they've been found at the tops of even the tallest trees in the region. So 100 feet up into the air. That, that is their preferred nesting area. So great blue heron, great bird that we have here in Colorado. I just saw one back in March. Um, fantastic birds. So uh, hummingbirds, of course, hummingbirds uh, utilize nests and trees. They are often found uh, in, in our evergreens. They utilize often lichen, lichen growing on trees and hair and other things to, to create that little tiny nest, just barely even a fraction of the size of your fist. So nesting hummingbirds, and then tree cavities. Tree cavities are super important for birds. I find that tree cavities are a great indicator of biodiversity. So you've got all these trees that may have a little bit of a cavity in it. And as an arborist, I look at that and I can say, well, it's, it's a bit hazardous because it's on the street side in a hugely populated area. But cavities in the backyard where it's you know, not that big and maybe it's not going to be around somebody absolutely just vital for our, our birds and other, other uh, mammals. But we have 85 species of North American birds that utilize those cavities in varying sizes. So the wood duck right here is does not nest on the ground like a lot of other ducks. Uh, it utilizes only cavities of, of, of wood. Uh, here's the male wood duck. And again, another one that was almost extinct by the 20th century. Uh, due to hunting and and mostly habitat destruction, everybody wants to clean up the the area because it's got dead wood and and doesn't look pretty. It looks pretty to me because that means habitat. Uh, but the wood duck has been stabilized a little bit due to some artificial cavity nesting boxes. So we are seeing an increase in in the populations of the wood duck. Thankfully. Beautiful birds, beautiful birds. Nobody ever thinks of the black cap chickadee as an as a cavity nester, but they are indeed. It doesn't need to be very big. It's a pretty small cavity, but they are indeed cavity nesters. So a very common bird here for uh, the Rocky Mountain region. We've got both the black cap chickadee and the mountain chickadee that are pretty common here, both cavity nesters. So great, great just to have a little cavity in a, in a tree, absolutely vital for habitat. Owls, all of our owls, except for the burrowing owls, utilize cavities in trees. So all of them, it's the great horn owls, the eastern screech owls, um, barn owls may be found in a barn, but it's just a larger cavity to me. So owls are absolutely, uh, absolutely require cavities for their for their young. And then we've got some great birds here in the Rocky Mountain region that utilize not just cavities, but um, thick bark and crevices and, and little spots in the tree where maybe the two branches come together and can create a little bit of a, a habitat uh, for that. So like the pygmy nuthatch uses those cavities to overwinter, they go into a toper. Um, and they'll stay in that state of almost sort of, it's sort of a, a hyper, type of hibernation. Uh, and then both of them will store seeds. They will cache seeds in all of those little crevices in those trees. And, and they remember most of them. So good, good source of habitat for both food source 
both as the tree producing the seeds, a place to store it, and then a place to live. So white-breasted nuthatch and the pygmy nuthatch, very common here in the Rocky Mountain region. So I'm not sure if a lot of people know about this. This is the Migratory Bird Treaty Act of 1918, which states that it is illegal to destroy habitats. Uh, there was a tree in my neighborhood that a client asked me to take a look at because the city of Denver said that it was hazardous and needs to be taken down. I threw the Migratory Bird Act at them just a month ago and said, well, regardless whether you think it needs to come down or not, you need to wait because I saw a pair of birds nesting in there, uh, the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. So lots of birds actually benefited from, from this act and it's over hundred years old. So um, I'm proud to say I, I love that, that act. All right, so of those, we've got almost 1900 species of birds in North America that utilize trees in some form. Um, I'm sorry, 1,900 species of birds in North America, 1,500 use trees in some form. And there are 15 million Americans watching birds. So if you want to help out birds, you can in install artificial nesting boxes. It doesn't have to be a cavity in a tree. And there are plenty of ways to do that without injuring the tree. You can put a, ropes around those trees. There's, there's various ways to do it. Uh, without permanent damage to that tree. I try not to nail into trees because it's it's a wound that doesn't need to be there when there are other ways to do it. So great way to encourage habitat nesting boxes, uh, habitat for nesting birds. This, in my opinion, is a little bit overkill, but each to their own. Kind of fun picture regardless. It's, and uh, and so talking about flight, let's let's go back in time. So the evolution of flight, the arboreal theory. How did things learn to evolve uh, flight? Well, there's two forms of theory. One is that they started to jump and and skip and fly from ground to tree. But the prevailing theory is from tree to ground. They learned how to glide first before they learned how to. Uh, actually lift off of the ground. So, and that's seen in Archaeopteryx. Archaeopteryx, uh, it was a great climber, had great claws, could climb to the top of the tree and then glide after prey. I think this picture of Archaeopteryx chasing this dragonfly is a little silly because the dragonfly has 150 million years of evolution on top of that Archaeopteryx. So there's no way that Archaeopteryx is actually catching that, but it's a fun, fun uh, piece of art regardless. And the flying squirrels, flying squirrels are gliders. They, they don't really, they can't lift off the ground, but they can fly uh, by gliding great long distance. So flight to, uh, tree, 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 tree to ground is the prevailing theory. All right, enough about birds. Let's go into my favorite section, which is insects. Uh, being an entomologist myself, uh, this is my favorite section. Uh, butterflies, moths, beetles, ants, spiders are in that category. They all kind of fall into that. So let's start with the American hornet moth. The host tree is poplars. This is a picture I took of this hornet moth in Wheat Ridge, Colorado. Uh, was, host, was found at the base of an aspen. That larval stage was tunneling in there. Not doing a ton of damage, um, but definitely uh, feeding on that wood. And then it emerged. This is this is considered a clear wing moth. So a moth species with clear wings, you can kind of see right there, but has that, that uh, mimicry color of a hornet just to protect itself because it has neither a biting mouth part nor a stinger, so it can't hurt you either way. Uh, it defends itself strictly with its coloration. So. Poplar, willows, you find those in. And then my other favorite, you're gonna hear that a lot. They're all my favorites. Uh, the morning cloak. Morning cloak is a butterfly that we see in early spring. They're the first out there because they overwinter as adults, but they absolutely utilize trees for their host plants. So birch, elm, hackberry, poplar, willow, all of those, they're pretty widespread throughout the entire 
uh, North America and into Europe areas. So a pretty common butterfly. I see them in the Rocky Mountain National Park area a lot up towards Fort Collins. I haven't seen that many more towards the Denver, few in Denver, but uh, not so much south. So they seem to be, in my opinion, more in that higher mountain region areas. And this is what the caterpillar stage looks like. So um, spiky black caterpillar, and that is a willow that is feeding on. Again, minimal damage, also just as a host plant. The western tiger, tiger swallowtail, everybody sees this one quite a bit midsummer. And uh, it's got the eye spots that we see. Those are also a defense type mechanism for um, making other prey like or uh, hunters like birds think that it's a snake or something like that. You know, those fake eye spots. Whereas in fact, its head is that red section right there. But again, linden, birch, cherry willow, all trees you would find in the Rocky Mountain area. American dagger moth, I know I've said it, another one of my favorites. A much, much larger group of trees that it uh, utilizes as a host tree. Um, myself, I've only found them generally in maples. They seem to prefer maples, but uh, hopefully somebody's found them, them in some of these other trees that it's known to utilize as a host plant. And the moth, uh, adult, this is the larval stage, the caterpillar stage, uh, fuzzy yellow caterpillar, but as a moth, it's actually kind of camouflage. They camouflage on the bark of trees really, really well for survival techniques. So nice to hang out on trees. And we again see this throughout all of pretty much uh, North America, mostly on the East Coast. All right, juniper hair streak. Juniper hair streak. You can tell juniper hair or the hair streak family because they've got these little hairs on the back end of them that. Uh, are kind of like fake antenna. They will actually wiggle them uh, to distract prey. Say you're a jumping spider going after it, thinking that's the head when in fact uh, it just kind of laps and, and jumps away. But uh, we see the juniper hair streak on all of our native junipers. They don't so much like the Fitzer junipers that were commonly planted 30, 40, 50 years ago, but uh, the native junipers, especially in the um, Southwest, region of the state, you'll find them. All right, I have a question for everybody and, and you can just say this out loud to yourself, but what is the state butterfly of Colorado? Does, do you know? I gave two little hints here. The name is composed of the state, Colorado and hair streak. So the Colorado hair streak is our state butterfly. And they feed on our native gamble oaks. So gamble oaks, when the Colorado State Butterfly was named, um, uh, it actually gave protection to the hair streak and we've seen increase in numbers of them. So the larval stage you don't typically see because they camouflage pretty well with that green on that leaf. On the, you typically see them on the underside of that leaf. But again, hair streak with those tails sticking out the back. Beautiful little butterfly, little butterfly. All right, the great ash sphinx. Great ash sphinx um, is primary host is ash trees. And again, that larval stage is just feeding on some of that green um, leafy material, doing very minimal damage to it. Um, but they will be found uh, feeding on lilac, privet, and aspen. Again, all things that we have here in Colorado. So here's a cool little list of butterflies and trees. So this, these are just butterflies. Hackberry butterfly, of course, feeds on just hackberry. But if you look at this list, we see a lot of oaks. We see a lot of willows on that list. So oaks and willows are absolutely great trees to promote uh, diversity in our insects. And everything listed in red on that can be found here in Colorado. Here's the list of moths. So moths, the big I.O. moth, um, which uh, feeds on beech, cherry, maple. There's oak and willow again. Um, Polymethus moths have a pretty big list, uh, but we see oaks in pretty much all these and willows in a lot of them as well. So 
So trees, trees are just absolutely great at supporting wildlife. They contribute to the ecosystem. Oaks can support 517 species of, of butterflies and moths. And that's a number that's, that's generally, um, that's, that's a worldwide number. So it's not necessarily Front Range or Colorado uh, or the Western, Western region. So oaks, oaks, 13% of our oaks, um, sorry, uh, oaks provide about 13% of that habitat. Willows here in Colorado, willows are actually kind of the number one, but in North America, oaks typically are the reigning, reigning champions. And trees, people sometimes will say, I don't have room in my garden because I have got a very small yard to grow flowers and I'm not able to contribute a lot for uh, floral resources. And I say, the sky is the limit. Let's, let's plant a tree. Let's plant something that flowers where you can produce a floral resource for bees and other pollinators like butterflies and moths because uh, you've got so much area. So a tree, a, a mature tree, we spread out that surface area uh, can be as big as a football field. So, so the sky is the limit as far as uh, surface area when you're trying to provide habitat for floral resources. And it's not just those flowers that are necessary. So yes, the flowers produce pollen and nectar, which a lot of, especially bees, will utilize as a food source. But it's the aphids and the scales that produce that that sticky honeydew. So when there are no flowers, um, a lot of, even bees, bees will find additional resources with that nectar, uh, with that uh, that honeydew, because it's a sugar source. So aphids feeding on the tree then feed other insects as well. Uh, you you guys are all probably familiar with wasps hanging around maybe an oak because it's got a scale. There, it's that sweet honeydew that they're looking for. So I, of course, would be remiss if I didn't include any bees. So this is the colorful willow minor bee. They are willow specialists. They only feed on willows. So willows, again, are absolutely important. If we didn't have willows, we would lose one of our absolutely amazing bee species because they don't feed on anything else. All right, this is a uh, male leaf cut mason bee that I found in Boulder a couple of years ago, 2019. Leaf cutter bees, just as the name suggests, cut out perfect circles and leaves uh, as nesting materials. The female that will cut out perfect circles or ovals uh, to take back to her nest. And here she is cutting that material um, in the corner. She's got it between her legs and then going down to the crack of this old log. So both logs, old wood on your property is a habitat in itself and the new material being produced as the leaves is vital for them as well. So. So leaf cutter bees are great. Um, if you want to learn more about leaf cutter bees, um, Pete Pan actually has one of my path presentations on just bees themselves. E.O. Wilson is a absolutely wonderful mentor of mine. He unfortunately passed away uh, a couple years ago. Uh, conservation biology is a discipline with a deadline. So. You just can't sit around and wait. So I say plant trees, plant trees today for tomorrow's generation. All right, let's move on to reptiles. I told you that I love insects. That's probably the largest section of the whole presentation. So, so let's move on to reptiles. I always find Larson comics to be appropriate for anything, um, but snakes, lizards, chameleons, iguanas, Worldwide, we have 250 species of anoles, and they're all absolutely tree-dwelling um, reptiles. They, in fact, some of them may never see the ground um, because they love to live in those canopies all the time. It's kind of a neat one. Uh, I was in Mexico last year, took a picture of this iguana, and uh, the only downside to iguanas is if you live in Florida and you get a 40 degree temperature drop, uh, then you get iguanas falling out of the sky. But otherwise, uh, trees and iguanas are hand in hand. And down in 
southern New Mexico, I'm sorry, southern Colorado down into New Mexico, we find the Colorado River tree lizard, not necessarily a lizard that's found only in the trees, but we typically only find them in areas with trees. So if it doesn't have trees in it, most likely it's just not a habitat that this uh, lizard prefers. So not a full-time dwelling lizard, but again, just has an association with those trees. And snakes, corn snakes. A lot of people don't realize that snakes are fabulous climbers. The bull snakes, corn snakes, corn snakes love to climb to hunt um, birds, eggs, frogs, various other, even um, other snakes or lizards. So great, great climbers uh, all the time. So bull snakes are that way as well. All right, pretty short on my reptiles, you can tell I'm not an expert in, in reptiles. Let's move on to fungi. So fungi, we've got quite a few species of fungus that um, are both food sources, so edible mushrooms, turkey tails. Turkey tails is great because it's found, humans love to eat turkey tail mushrooms, they're pretty edible. We make tea out of them, but we find wildlife, both wildlife, large, large and small, that will utilize mushrooms, turkey tails as a food source. So without rotting, decaying trees, we wouldn't have that mushroom uh, growing on them. So there's that relationship with those trees again. And then lichens, lichens of varying kinds. We've got specific lichens that only grow on trees, such as this one right here, um, only on oaks. So without those oaks, we don't find this lichen at all. And then moss, we've got some mosses that prefer, not necessarily have to, but prefer to grow on the trunks of trees, uh, like the cypress-leaved flat moss. Um, this one is definitely uh, often just on, on the side, on the lower side of a, of a tree. And then that duff, that, that litter, leaf litter in itself just has so much wildlife in it uh, that it's just can't even fathom it. There's an estimate of, you know, a one uh, a cubic square foot can have millions of little uh, arthropods and other living organisms in it. Uh, couldn't even count those in your lifetime. So sow bugs, the roly polies and the, the daddy long legs, the centipedes, like the, we've mostly got rock centipedes out here. Um, the springtails, springtails are kind of fun and the millipedes, of course. So without that leaf litter, we don't have other bugs that are breaking down those nutrients. They're the decomposers of, of the forests and they help to put nutrients back into the soils, which then the tree reuses and produces new growth on. So that cycle of life really requires these insects and uh, other arthropods to really break that down and, and be part of that cycle. And then, of course, people, you know, we have people that, uh, as kids, we all love to kick around leaves. And if you uh, haven't kicked around leaves, you need to go back to being a kid. All right. So one of my favorite families, the oaks, of course, we have 600 species of oaks worldwide. 90 of those can be found in North America. And back again to lichens, 716 types of lichens have been found living on trees. I took this picture of a scrub oak in the Four Corners area with just a magnificent array of different types of lichens living on it. So pretty, pretty neat in itself. And the oak moss lichen, as its name suggests, prefers oak. Uh, they will definitely be found on usually the older growth trees. And then 12 lichens, 12 lichens that we find that only live on oaks. So oaks are absolutely vital for all sorts of habitat. And I don't know if you all know this, but there are 60,000, there are more than 60,000 trees worldwide, different types of trees. Uh, North America, we've got um, just a little bit less than 1,400 species of oaks, uh, I'm sorry, of, of trees uh, here in North America. And so the top three families, uh, the Guminaceae, which changed to Fab 
the ACA, that's the locust trees and um, all those trees that produce those pods. Uh, Ruby ACA, give you all a hint of what family that is. I had it as a drink this morning. That's coffee. Coffee is a huge family, second runner up. And the myrtle family, myrtle ACA. Myrtle family is pretty big in itself. So the Fabaceae family, the pea family, that's honey locust, red bud, Kentucky coffee tree, pasha trees, Japanese pagodas, Palo Verdes. We don't really have Palo Verdes here, but we do in Arizona. Uh, so all really fascinating trees. And with that, we're going to jump into the past again and look at the fact that the Fabaceae family, the the legume family had a huge impact on the development of humans. We now cultivate peas, but the a pot on a locust is actually edible. It's got a sweet kind of um, seed to it. So uh, utilized both by animals um, and by humans, you can actually find um, products that attract deer. If you were a hunter, I'm not a hunter, but you can find them on the web that are made out of honey locust pods. So they're a food source to attract wildlife. Um, I love deer, so maybe I just get some just to, to attract deer at my place. I think in the middle of Denver, I don't think anybody would appreciate that, but uh, I would. And then we've got a bunch of extinct um, wildlife that uh, have historically been feeding on these types of trees. So um, especially the sloths, the ground sloths. So here's the Joshua tree. Joshua tree had a larger range when the Shasta, Shasta ground sloth was, was on this planet uh, still alive. And so those we've there have been dung that's been found with Joshua seeds in there. And this sloth is large enough to eat those pods whole. So they will eat those off the tree and then move about and poop them out somewhere else. And you've got uh, fertilized seeds to produce new Joshua trees. So the Joshua tree definitely was at a large, much larger range 10,000 years ago, 10, 13,000 years ago than, than it does today. And that was a small sloth compared to these ones. So these ones uh, were both free feeders, uh, there is a large uh, area of study with the distribution of um, avocados. Avocados and the ground sloths were hand in hand uh, because again, they would eat those, those avocados whole and then uh, move on to an area and produce new little avocado trees. So. Both of these, unfortunately, are extinct. I would love to have seen these. And uh, my home state, New Mexico, uh, the oldest fossil climbing reptile was found in New Mexico in 2005, 300 million years old, pretty neat. And one of the trees that was probably climbing 300 million years ago was a cycad. Uh, and maybe some of the ginkgo, older ginkgo species that don't exist anymore. Uh, we found fossils of cycads uh, that are 300 million years old and, and ginkgo, different types of ginkgos. And you'll see on this uh, chart coming up of timelines, here's a cool picture of different male and female parts of the ginkgo, but uh, oops, I'm getting ahead of myself. So. The oldest pollinator, the oldest pollinator is actually a thrip. A lot of people think of thrips as feeding on plants and, and a greenhouse pest, but in fact, uh, they actually had little hairs on them that were designed for carrying pollen. And this is probably ginkgo or, or cycad pollen that was found on them. So pretty neat, pretty neat. Here's a little closer picture up of that. So this specimen is 110 million years old. And pollen in itself is super neat. So we've got this explosion of diversity of pollen grains. So the big spiky ones, ye yellow spiky ones, I swear that's not coronavirus, that's actually uh, sunflower. 
Um, but uh, different ginkgo pollen grains tend to be a little smoother and uh, different different types, different um, different food for different folks. As different insects, bees particularly like different types of pollen. So ginkgos, ginkgos are, uh, we have the one remaining ginkgo left, ginkgo biloba, uh, that is 50 million years old. Uh, but there are actually several type, several species of ginkgos uh, that predate that that are no longer in existence. All right, so this is that chart that I was talking about. Ginkgos are some of the oldest trees. Conifers, cycads, they predate those angiosperms, flowering insect, um, sorry, flowering trees by a long time. They're 200 million years in some cases. So flowering trees, only started to evolve around 145 million years ago. So these ginkgos and cycads predate those, and gymnosperms, uh, the evergreens are, are super old. Ginkgo again, here's uh, some of those different types. Ginkgo yemenensis, uh, 170 million years old. And you can get ginkgo nuts on Amazon. They're actually pretty tasty. Um, but there, again, there's been fossils found with um, profusus, profusus ornus birds uh, that were eating ginkgo nuts. So we found dung with those uh, ginkgo nuts in them. So they've been eating ginkgo nuts way before Amazon even was founded. All right. Not convinced? Let's move on to humans and their dependency on trees. All right, we all love our spices. So different types of spices, these all come from trees. And if you can guess which two come from the same tree, give you just a second to look over that list. It is actually the mace and the nutmeg. So the mace and the nutmeg come from the same tree. The, the mace is the outer shell of that nutmeg, that, that nut inside of it. So spices, we've got lots of different types of nuts that are from trees, uh, the almonds, which I had for lunch today, the uh, sashios, pecans, walnuts, all sorts of stuff. And then fruits, there are so many fruits that we don't uh, even utilize here in, in the Americas. You can go to the botanic gardens and see a Buddhist hand. Buddhist hand is related to, uh, it's in the, the, the linen and lime family. Um, star fruit, most people have heard about star fruit, pretty, pretty neat little fruit. And these are all from trees. And then of course, olives, who doesn't like olives? I do, I love my green olives particularly. And for those that are woodworkers, tongue oil comes from a tree and not to mention the wood itself uh, that the woodworkers use utilizing. So we utilize trees in our everyday life. And for those that can't grow up, uh, you know, here's a good old tree house. I had a tree house when I was a kid. And for those that don't grow up, we still play around in trees. These are all my arborist friends. So you, know, you don't have to leave the trees. You can get a job doing it. It's pretty fun. And so, you know, Looking at all those reasons, go back to my second slide. Do I really have a thousand reasons why I love trees? Well, if you tally up everything in this presentation, I come up with 6,589 reasons to love trees. And so with that, uh, I'm gonna leave you with a few recommendations for places to learn about trees. Of course, the Sand County Almanac is a great one by Aldo Leopold, uh, E.O. Wilson, um, has a number of books. And then one of my absolute favorites, The Nature of Oaks by Douglas Tallamy. And if you're an Audible fan, uh, he actually reads his own book. He's a great author and uh, he reads, he's great at narration on his own book. Um, Song of Trees, these are only a few of the great tree books out there. Um, and so unless we move quickly to protect global biodiversity, we'll soon lose most of the species composing life on Earth. E.O. Wilson, who was an ant specialist, and he has lots of examples of ants and trees co-evolving together and uh, requiring their, their growth together. So 
they they need each other. Uh, with that, uh, anybody has any questions, feel free to reach out to me. Here is my email address. You can also find me at Instagram at CO Naturalist and of course LinkedIn at Ryan Bartlett. Uh, with that, we've got some time to take, we've got about 10 minutes to take uh, some questions. Happy to open that up. Um, Nicole, if you want to field any of those. Yes, wonderful. Thank you so much for that presentation. That was amazing. I know I learned a ton about not just pollinating insects, but the role of trees in, in everyday life. Yeah. It's a cycle of life. <laughs> Absolutely. And um, we've gotten a lot of people saying thank you in the uh, chat as well. So I think people really enjoyed this one. Um, and we do have a couple questions um, from people. So I will start going through those. If anyone else has questions, um, feel free to put those in the chat and we'll try to get to as many as we can. Um, but to start off, someone said, one of my neighbors was very upset because a tree on city property was removed recently that had bats roosting in it. Um, can anything be done to prevent something like this in the future? I think this was kind of going off of that um, Mi Migratory Bird Act, I think that you were talking Migratory about. Bird Act, um, which honestly I would have to look into to see if it includes bats. Surely you would think it would. Um, yes, yeah, so that is basically saying you can't remove a nest of say a bird nest within a, a, an area where it, when it's nesting season, um, the city's responsibility is to make sure that they are providing a safe habitat, or, I'm sorry, safe habitat for humans. So if it's in the city right away and it's hollow, um, that is a hazard to, to people. And so um, fighting that can sometimes be tough, but even if you can just point it out to the city beforehand, if you know that those bats are in there, um, the city of Denver is willing to work with you and give an extension on stuff like that. They they have been for me. They don't usually fight me on that at all. So they'll say, yes, okay, now that it's winter, nothing's roosting in there because they've all migrated south. It's time to remove this tree. So, you know, if you're able to open up a dialogue with them, I find the city of Denver and some other municipalities to be pretty understanding, uh, in my opinion. Yeah, that's great news. I feel like that's not uh, you know, and and there are there are tree companies out there when they come across nests of birds. Um, a lot of us that do that type of work know the resources we have to take them to uh, rehabilitation areas that'll take them and and help to raise those young. Or we get this all the time. We get some of those winds that knock it down a tree, and then you've got owls, uh, little owlets running around and. Um, there are organizations that will take them and raise them and release them into the wild. So there are resources, but uh, absolutely just opening a dialogue beforehand is key. Awesome. Yeah, thank Excellent. you. Yeah. Out. Um, okay, next question. Um, someone asked, do you have a pie chart of Colorado specific trees that support butterflies, moths, birds, et cetera? Um, you had a, a global pie chart or a pie chart of global trees. Um, do you have I have, I have started to put it together. I am not a researcher in that aspect myself. So it's just a matter of finding the information. I will eventually put it together. There's just not enough daylight in the day to, to do it. So yes, yeah, so someday we'd love to just have a specific front range, uh, not necessarily just Colorado, but front range. But uh, the interesting thing about Colorado is uh, nobody knows how many species of willows, I shouldn't say nobody knows, people don't realize how many willows we have. We have 35 species of native willows in Colorado. Some of those willows aren't very big, they're only a foot or two tall, uh, but they're still in the willow family. And then we have five non-native species of willows that can be found in the in the Colorado area. So 40 different species of willows versus uh, the gamble oak, which is one of our really only native oaks. Um, not the only one, but uh, uh, we do have quite a few oaks, but they're all mostly imports. So, yeah, just learning about the different species of trees, um, 35 different species of willows. We've got lots of different um, types of trees in that family. The pop, That's the poplar family, so aspens, cottonwoods and stuff. So that family is pretty large. It's the major contributor out here. 
Awesome. Hope um, that answered that question. I think so. Um, we have a couple questions that are going off of that kind of topic. Um, the first one, when we are talking about willows as critical habitat, do curly willows count in that category? They can. So they may actually produce willows out here can get some cavities. And so I've seen curly willows. Curly willows are fun. Um, I've seen curly willows with a, a small cavity big enough for a chickadee uh, or for, say, a, um, what's another, a downy woodpecker, something like that. So willows can produce small cavities and uh, their um, pollen and nectar are both used by both early pollinating uh, bees and other insects, flies, wasps. So absolutely, absolutely. curly willows are, are fun, not native, but fun. Uh, and so that one was not on my list of non-native willows. So let's call it 41 species of willows that can be found here in Colorado, because I've seen a few. Perfect. <laughs> Um, similar question, what species of willow and oak would you recommend for creating bird habitat in Colorado, specifically for this person in an area with wetter soil? Wetter soil, uh, willows like wetter soil, so that might be a better choice. Your certain species of trees, and you, for whoever this is, feel free to reach out to me directly because there are some species of trees that don't tolerate wet soils at all that you actually get crown or root rot in those areas and then other trees that thrive in it. So it's kind of a loaded question. We have lots of possibilities. Happy to throw a few options out at you, but uh, uh, if you have wet soil or area where the drainage sort of just pools, that, that actually does open up some possibilities um, for some fun trees. So please reach out to me. Awesome. Um, and then we just got another question in the chat, similar. What types of trees would you recommend that can tolerate low water conditions? Not necessarily. Well, the, ga the, the gamble oak is uh, a dry country oak. We find those in some of our, our dry, arid regions. Um, so that's a fun one. Uh, the bur oak is another good one that uh, tolerates pretty dry, dry environments. Uh, the Kentucky coffee tree is a fabulous uh, tree that uh, is fairly drought tolerant. Um, Kentucky coffee trees in that uh, pea family. And there's the, they produce little fat pods on them, but then there's the espresso, which is a seedless variety, which has a pretty nice shape as well. But I think the espresso, I'm sorry, the pods are fun because you can make decaf coffee out of them. You roast those those pods or the beans in them. So uh, there's quite a few uh, that can tolerate, and there's a lot that don't. The drought tolerance can be tough in Colorado. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, I think that's kind of most of our tree questions. Um, someone asked, how widespread in Colorado is the hummingbird moth? We have lots of different types of hummingbird moths. So one that you may have just recently been seeing in your garden is the white line sphinx, uh, which is a type of hummingbird moth. They're the large daytime moths that uh, flutter like a butterfly. Um, they feed on privet uh, particularly, and uh, I'd have to look it up, but there are lots of different types of, of species of those. Um, and we can find them throughout all of the Colorado region. There are some that are more higher country type moths and a few that are lower country, but I see, I've seen quite a few species here in, in Denver. Awesome. Yeah. Um, someone asked, what advice would you give to sway people away from removing the moss from their trees, trying to get that like perfect suburban aesthetic? Um, Education. A lot of people think that uh, the moss is damaging their tree or the lichen is damaging its tree when it's typically not uh, not damaging it in much of any recordable way. So um, yeah, just kind of education. That's, that's kind of what I, why I do what I do. Um, 
people tend to not understand and, and remove it if they don't. So um, yeah, I don't know if I have a better answer for that. Well, that's, I think that's a great answer. Um, and our last question, perfect timing. Um, are there any books that you would recommend on native Colorado trees? Native Colorado trees? Uh, books on native Colorado trees. I don't have any off the top of my head. I would check the Native Plant Society. They have lists of both plants and trees. Uh, and the Native Plant Society's got a website. They've got a list of books. Uh, anything on their list is probably pretty decent because they're they're great, great organization. So yeah, check out the Native Plant Society of Colorado. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much again for the presentation and answering all of those questions. I think people really, really enjoyed this one. Um, it was super informative. And um, for everyone who's stuck around this long, we will be recording. Well, it's recording right now and we will be posting the recording to our YouTube channel. So you're welcome to watch it back in the future. Um, and yeah, thank you again, Ryan, for being here. It was awesome. Great, great, Nicole. Thank you very much. Have a great rest of your day, everyone. Will do.